Hi everybody. Um, good morning slash afternoon. Um, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here. I can't see all of you well because of the, the big light, but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a privilege uh, to be here and have this time with you. Um, it's also hard to follow such a confident speaker um, who is oozing confidence. And I was sitting there reflecting on how little confidence I have. Um, and I think that, that that comes from the knowledge that while you wake up every day and try to do your work to the best of your ability, you're so far away from the vision of the country that you hope to see and live in. Um, in fact, just today our Delhi kids are preparing uh, for a big march um, to stand up against the recent horrific um, acts of violence against kids like Asifa. So long, long way to go. So I first started thinking about the name Chrysalis and if you look on your table you'll find uh, little white butterflies because uh, as I was thinking about uh, coming here today and the, the name Chrysalis, I was reminded um, of a wonderful man I met about a month ago called Milan. Um, if you Google the butterfly man of India, you will find this guy uh, Milan. But I met him in Ahmedabad uh, and I, I met him and heard his story. He's a Nepali young artist who was struggling a lot to find a way to make art relevant for the world. Um, and so he went through a very bad time, got onto drugs, became an alcoholic, eventually decided to do a pilgrimage through India um, to try to be inspired to find what he wanted to do. Uh, and he came back to Nepal, uh, still disillusioned, still not knowing what he wanted to do. But the day that he reached his home, there was a white butterfly on his window sill. And suddenly he said, that's it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take white butterflies around the world and make art out of a simple cutout of a white butterfly. And so that was the little white butterfly that you have with you today. And of course, the butterfly is evocative of so many wonderful things. But look at what happened with the white butterfly. He took it across the east uh, sides of the world. Uh, he took it to the west um, and decorated and brought joy and happiness to people. He gifted it to children to bring wonder and joy to children. He used it to honor the dead um, and took it into cemeteries, burial places, etc. Um, and most of all, he said, the butterfly is the symbol of love. Um, and by spreading butterflies everywhere, we really take and give to the world what is most lacking, um, love for ourselves, for each other, and for the world. And so then I, I looked up the, the definition. I realized I didn't exactly know what a chrysalis was. And it was interesting here. It says the hard outer case in closing a chrysalis, the splitting of the chrysalis and the slow unfolding of wings. And I got a little bit intrigued by this idea of what does the slow unfolding of our wings actually mean? Um, and who are those people who unfold their wings? And who are those people been in my life? And who are those people in your life? And then again, the name of this space, um, who are those people of worth? And so I'm going to tell you a few stories and then a little bit of my own story. Uh, but the first story when I think of people of worth, people who have spread their wings, is from across the world. Uh, this is a young man called Julio. Um, and Julio, the middle of winter, this is a bitter February night, and he is walking down a pretty deserted road in America. And he walks down the road, and he sees a teenager walking from the other side, hooded, looking down at his feet. And when the teenager comes near him, the teenager pulls out a knife and says, give me your wallet. And so Julio does what I think most of us do, would have done. 
He was fearful, and so he took out his wallet and he gave it to the teenager. Teenager turns around to run off, but then Julio does something that I think most of us in this room would not do. He says, hey kid, the kid turns around. He says, it's such a bitter cold night and you don't have a coat. Why don't you take my coat? So this kid is sort of intrigued, turns around, uh, comes back. It is a cold night. Julio takes off his coat, gives it to the kid. Kid turns to run off again. And then Julio does something that I think none of us in this room potentially would do. He says, hey kid, and the kid turns around. And he says, you know, I was headed to the local restaurant down the street. Why don't you come and have dinner with me? So the kid is a little shocked, but the kid is hungry. And so the kid goes and they go to the local diner and they sit down and over three hours they talk. And Julio understands the life of this child and what has led him to lead the kind of life that, that he leads. And it's an incredible conversation of two very unlikely people. And at the end of the dinner, the bill comes and they give the bill to Julio and Julio looks at the kid and says, you know, under normal circumstances, I certainly would have paid the bill, but kid, you have my wallet. And so the kid takes the wallet and he slides it across the table back to Julio. And Julio says, no kid, that's not enough. I need your knife too. And the kid takes the knife and he pushes it across the table and they go their separate ways. And I think a lot about what, what was it that made Julio able to respond to physical fear of your life with compassion? What was it? And how much is that living a life of worth? How much is that learning to spread our wings? My second story is again about two very unlikely people. This is my greatest mentor. He wouldn't call himself a mentor. Uh, his name is Jayishpai and he lives in Ahmedabad. Very simple man who is the closest I have ever met to a, a living Gandhian. Lives his life every day, not focusing on outcomes, not focusing on wealth, just focusing on what can I do in the minute to make the person next to me a little bit happier? And so he's the first person I'm going to talk about. And the second is my brother, very different. He's a fashion photographer, uh, lives in New York City. Um, this is one of his uh, recent photographs. He's done a series on, on eyes. And for some reason, I wanted my brother to meet Jayishbhai. And I didn't know why, it was one of those instinctive things. And so I told him, I said, Rishad, I said, just come. And my brother said, what's the agenda? What's the schedule? What are we going to do? And I said, really, I don't know. In fact, we may get to Ahmedabad and Jaish may be, may be called to some village or some, he may not even be there if we're, if we're not lucky. Um, but for some reason, my brother trusted me and, and these two came together. And I want to narrate what happened on that day. So we just followed Jayesh by on his regular work through the day. And my brother is a smoker, quite a chain smoker actually. So we were walking down a crowded Ahmedabad street and there was a young man smoking. None of us knew this man. So Jayesh Bhai goes over to the man, starts chatting with him for two, three minutes and puts his arm around him and says, hey, give me your cigarette. I'm watching my brother huh, from New York where you don't even make eye contact when you're walking on the streets. Look, this guy takes his cigarette and hands it to Jayesh Bhai. Two, three hours later, he does it again. He finds another young man, again smoking, again, and it's all very happy. There's no, you know, talking to this person two, three minutes, give me your cigarette, it's not good for you. Kid gives the cigarette. Third time it happens again. Um, this time the guy had a whole packet of cigarettes in his pocket. Um, and Jayesh Bhai said, not just the cigarette in your mouth, you give, um, he told me, me, he said, you take the whole packet. And he said, you crush it and you throw it away. 
And so finally, I could see my brother just had to say something. And he said, Jaish Bhai, he said, what are you doing? He said, you know, those aren't people you know. They could have slapped you. They could have walked away. They could have abused you. And Jaish Bhai turned to my brother and he said, if that was your real brother, would you have told him to give the cigarette? And my brother said, yes. And he said, well, for me, those are my real brothers. Those are my real brothers. That level of interconnectedness, that what is mine is not just my children and my home and my organization and my city, but can you expand that to really believing that someone on the other side of the world is your brother and therefore like the fear just disappears. And my third story um, is a story of a student. My greatest learnings in my own life have come from my kids. Um, this is a girl uh, called Priyanka from Pune, lived in a low-income community not far from here, uh, grew up with a very troubled, difficult background. Um, father is imprisoned for life. Um, mother was a single mother raising Priyanka. She um, struggled a lot growing up in this community. And then she stumbled into Teach for India through a musical that we were doing called Maya. That's her costume there where she played a nine-headed snake. Um, and through the 18-month journey of Maya, we were trying to not just stage a musical, but practice as teachers and kids three values, courage, compassion, and wisdom. And so you see here uh, one of the random acts of kindness days that we did where we told the children, go out on the streets and just spread love. And so this elderly lady, Priyanka had never met before, um, but she went and you see the joy on both of their faces when you're able to connect through love. In fact, that story has another interesting side to it. As the kids were going uh, and meeting people and talking to people, they found an, an elderly couple sitting down and it turns out that it was their anniversary. And uh, they came to me and they said, you know, it's our anniversary and we actually were not planning to do anything for our anniversary and we never, ever imagined that we would get all this spontaneous love from a group of kids. So that was my, my um, initial experience of Priyanka. I found her incredibly wise, incredibly mature, thoughtful, beautiful, beautiful child. And through this experience, she actually um, earned a, a scholarship to take her to the United World College in Italy. And so here you see a very special moment in my life, which was the moment in Mumbai airport where she was going into the airport to leave, of course, the first kid in many generations of her family to ever go abroad and the first Teach for India student to actually get a full scholarship to study in a top university abroad. And so she's going off, uh, you see her here wearing three layers of clothing in the hot Bombay weather because she was so worried about being overweight um, with her one suitcase and her allowance that she was wearing all her extra layers with her. And then this was an incredible moment for me where she got to her college and she sent this picture on a WhatsApp group to all the other children. Um, because for me, this picture made it possible. She was telling other kids that it doesn't matter what your background and it doesn't matter what your struggles and what your opportunities are, but you can do it. You can do it. And I'm going to show you um, a few months later, she was invited to Bulgaria. Um, and again, keep in mind, a student who came in not able to really speak English, not understanding even what values were, with no understanding of the dreams, this was Priyanka speaking in Bulgaria, something that she wrote completely from scratch herself.
Hold it. The story begins. A story that started 16 years ago. She was born in the arms of her mother, no other support whatsoever. She grew up, slipped from her mother's arms and walked, no other support whatsoever. Low caste, no father, single mother, slums, they all said. Shy and timid, she was labelled or rather made. Only she knew the truth, the fact that she was scared, scared of raising her voice, scared of making a choice, because choice and voice were never a choice for her. Wait, did I forget to introduce myself? I'm Priyanka from India. But before I go any further, let me tell you something about me and my mother. We were in the dark lanes and alleys of my community that night when and where the Muslims and the Hindus fought with swords. Each for India has given me three important lessons. And these three lessons have been the steps to leadership for me. Lesson number one, liberation. Liberation from the fear of failure, fear of what others might say. Lesson number two, empowerment. Empowerment to speak my mind, to do what my heart and mind says and to stand up for what I believe in. Lesson number three, enlargement. Enlargement of the self, realizing that it's not about changing others, it's about changing myself. Um. So from uh, Italy, she graduated and got a full scholarship uh, to a top university, Franklin Marshall, in the US. Um, and I'm constantly in touch with her, but this is an uh, image just from last week uh, where she is one of the, the lead actresses in a Broadway revue called um, All That Jazz. Some of you may know it. Um, so to me, um, she represents such a person of worth and to see her slowly unfolding her wings um, and to hear her amazing gift of oration and the way that she's spreading her learnings and her failures and her challenges makes me incredibly proud. Uh, so just, just a, little, a little bit about me. Um, I uh, came back to India when I was 18. I lived most of my life abroad. And I walked into a community in Mumbai and started teaching. Um, it was very different from the background that I grew up with, where I grew up in top schools with everything that I could have wanted. And I went into the community, and unlike what I thought, I thought I would be very disturbed by the poverty, by the violence, and I was. But much more than that, I was blown away by the resilience, by the courage that exists in some of our poorest communities. Um, and so I started a program called Akanksha, and I spent 17 years doing a lot of direct work myself with children. Those years taught me the greatest, greatest lessons of my own life. And we started first an after-school program, and then what became India's sort of first um, government uh, private partnership model for schools, where we were partnering with the government to say, with the same kids, the same money, the same facilities, we can have dramatically different results for our kids. And then 17 years later, um, I said, how do we do this at scale? Because when we saw examples and where our kids were and how they were growing, not just in terms of being in top universities, but in terms of being able to stand up for what they believed in, we just said, how do we do this um, at scale? How do we actually shift the, the system? Um, and since by nature I'm a teacher and I use every teaching opportunity for my own kids, um, I'm going to ask Rituja to come on stage. Um, Rituja didn't know she was being asked to come on stage. She's actually here to attend something with me after this conference. Um, but I thought since she's here, there's no better uh, way to tell you what Teach for India does um, than to just ask her in her own words to share um, what Teach for India has been for her. So just two, three minutes, sweetie, whatever you want to share. Hello, my name is Rituja, and yeah, so I began 
um, teach for India. Like I was a TFI kid when I was in my fourth grade, and when when I came from a private school to a PMC school where I had to call my teachers Didi or Bhaiya. And it was very confusing for me, like why do we even call them Didi and Didi or Bhaiya? And last two to three weeks ago, I was just talking to Shahin Didi about the significance of calling them by this name. And she just said that the bond that we have with them, we don't want it, our teachers to be like, they are going to teach us and they are going to be the ones who we are going to follow, but they are our brothers and sisters who are going to help us and we are also going to help them in return. So yeah, Teach for India has made me speak right now because if I look back to myself when I was in sixth grade I was very shy and I didn't even know like who am I as a person what are the values that I hold or believe in and on the courage to even speak up in front of my parents was very difficult for me but then when we had our Maya musical and when we had a Teach for India fellows in there that was the time when I got to know the person who I am and how much commitment we need to be, like how much committed we need to be in order to achieve our goals in life. So just to give you a brief about our, what we do in our Teach for India classrooms is, so we have teachers coming in, we have, a, like we have teachers who will teach us for two years and then they leave us. But it, it doesn't end there. So I am in touch with my uh, Bhaiya who taught me in fourth grade and we still talk and we still like have fun and have those chats so it is not just a way of a teacher teaching us but in return also giving them back something. Okay, so right now I am studying in Avasara Academy which is in Baudan and um, two weeks ago I heard back from United World College that I'm going to fly to Thailand for my 11th and 12th grade and I really feel proud of that because I also come from a very low income family where my father is an auto rickshaw driver and my mother is a beautician and she loves social work. So she just met Shahin Didi and she was crying like streaming with tears and she was so proud of me and yeah that is like something that I would like you guys to think also is whatever you are doing like the businesses that you are doing, are you doing something to change the world? Are your steps being contributing for India's better? And yeah, thank you. Can I ask one more, one more question? Can you, can you, I'm just going to ask her, ask her one more question. Um, a value that is important to you, and also you're, you're speaking with an audience of entrepreneurs and, and business people. Um, what is a value you believe is important for the country, for them to hold? I personally feel that reflection is something that is very important like personally initially I didn't like reflecting about the day or what went good or what didn't go, go well but I feel that when Didi said that it is you like everyone is sitting here who are entrepreneurs I feel that reflection is something that is going to help you because think about a day when you are working in your companies or working with customers and something goes bad or something goes good and at times small things can change, like small things can build up, uh, build up to become a very big thing. And when you don't realize it, when you are in your entrepreneur world, you don't realize those small things that are happening in your lives. And when you sit back, at like when you at night when you just sit back and reflect about the things that went well and the things that are not going well, what can you do about it, or how can you make them better next time when you are approaching the same thing, or making that thing. Imp like improve from what it was before. So I feel that reflection is something that all of you have to keep in mind. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my, my kids know that I always put them on the spot and ask them to do things with no, no preparation. But I, I thought that was the best way to show you what Teach for India is really trying to do and what we stand for. Um, and that's a very special girl, so remember her because I think she's going to do pretty amazing things for the world. Um, I think really uh, what we're trying to do in, in one sentence and linking it to the theme of this conference is this. Um, how do we give every child the chance to live a life of worth? 
um, and give them the opportunities, the experiences, the challenges, the dialogue to be able to actually do that, knowing that for all of us, it's such an up and down journey, it's such a roller coaster, but eventually, um, can we get closer to what we believe our purpose is, um, closer to not just what we want to do and what we want to achieve, but much more fundamentally, who do we want to be? Um, what is the character, the values that we want to actually define us? Um, and so I leave you with uh, really that thought, which I think Ritja said uh, very beautifully as well, that in the course of, of your lives, um, what can you do um, way beyond? And I think thinking about why, because the how all of us can figure out, but really immersing ourselves in why does this matter in today's world to really be a person of worth and to spread that to others. Um, and then the how will follow naturally. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. We request you to please be seated on the stage. Thank you so much. Wow. The white butterfly. What can I say? Um, how important education is. You know, when I look at a lot of things happening in the world today, when I look at a lot of children, and a lot of times I say, yaar, padhai karke kya hoga? And for some reason, I feel ki jo, jo education cheez hai, wo ek civic sense aap mein jaagta hai. It's not about how history might help you in the future or how geography might not help you in the future, but it's a basic civic sense that education gives you that, that works here. Um, you know, the question that I ask myself is, Julio, what made him respond to fear with compassion is your search. Uh, we'll come to that a little later, but right now I would like to keep this session open for the audience to, you know, if you have two or three questions for uh, Miss Mystery, we would take that up right away. Questions? Yes. MG sir has a question. Shine, it was a pleasure uh, listening to you. And um, uh, I, I thought of asking questions from stage, but then said, I thought we are already behind schedule. Uh, it was uh, not the summer of 69 for you, it was the summer of 1989 for you when you were in, in Mumbai. And uh, it was by chance that you were left behind for a week and your parents left for US and then you were in India for a week. So I personally believe that, that there are no accidents in life, everything happens for a reason. I think that one week you stayed back I think that was a starting point. And then from there, the, the entire journey for, for Akansha and then Teach for India started. Can you just elaborate as to the kind of challenges you came across, right? From you being a very shy person, that's what you mentioned in your book. And from there to here, uh, we see you speaking uh, so beautifully and uh, you going and convincing the parents of children in the slums, you going and convincing principals uh, in more than 20 odd schools to get a room for yourself and all those challenges. As an audience, we may not be able to, uh, I'm not sure whether they will be able to connect unless until you share with them as to how from there, 20 years ago to here, where we have reached and how it was all made possible. So in just maybe even five, 10 minutes, you can share about it. <clears throat> so firstly, the shy thing is interesting. I, I was an incredibly shy child. I was the kind of kid in class who when they were going around in a circle and I knew it would come to my chance, I wouldn't even be able to listen to everybody before because I would be so nervous about uh, what I was saying. And I think um, the turning point for me was like learning a little bit less, learning to think about myself a little bit less and learning to think about what I cared about changing a little bit more. And so even the confidence that I've developed and am developing uh, today comes from that, that like what I believe I'm trying to do and the vision of unleashing potential and the belief that like we're not going to want to live in this country and this world unless we really allow every person in the country to unleash their potential. 
um, comes from there. Uh, my own journey, just a little bit about it and the challenges, I think again, um, I came back at 18, uh, didn't speak a word of any Indian language, had no context, um, had no teaching experience and walked into a community and said like, I want to teach. Um, and so you can imagine the challenges that came up, like people not taking me seriously, not being able to communicate, people thinking that so many people have come into communities, made promises and left. But I think there was a very, very uh, deep belief that something is wrong in the world. Um, I was in a high school in the US where for uh, our 16th birthdays, everybody talked about which car they would get, not whether they would get a car or not. So the contrast between that and coming into communities here was huge and it left me with this real belief that something is unfair in the world and also with this idea that it's such a massive opportunity. Like if today we have 75 odd percent of our, our kids not successfully going on to college, like look at what will happen to the country if we reverse that. Um, challenges were many, like how do we raise funds still continues to be a huge challenge. Um, how do we mobilize the kind of people to do this work? Um, how do we, in the first four or five years, we were all volunteers, like how do you get volunteers to... So challenges were many, but I think the learning over the years is in how to see the challenges um, and just to hold perspective in a very different way and to sort of embrace challenges. So one of the things now that we tell our kids um, is this very simple phrase, problem equals, and whenever we say problem equals, the kids have to say opportunity, right? And it's really, it's a shift that is quite an incredible shift to think about. So I guess my biggest learnings on the journey have been that all the struggles are internal and the way we see things, if we're able to shift that, we can deal with all of the, the other external stuff. Uh, Shine ma'am, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts today. Uh, one question is that we are in a big number here as an entrepreneurs. And uh, is there any way we could connect to you or help you with the kind of work which you are doing? Because maybe many of our businesses in different ways, but the kind of resource in terms of people, in terms of teams we have, those may have skills which can work along with your skills. So is there any way where we as an entrepreneurs can connect with your work? Yeah, I mean, that's my most absolute favorite question. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for asking. Um, there are 320 million kids in the country, right? So that's the scale of the, the problem and how daunting it is. And there's just absolutely no way we're going to get an excellent education to every kid without not just some of you helping, but every single person who can uh, helping in some way. Um, so so that the short answer is yes, absolutely. Just write directly to me. I will send a, a follow-up email after this to all of you with like specific ways that you can engage, but really quickly top of, of the mind is spreading an awareness um, of our work. That's really, really important for us to find our fellows. These are men and women of incredible character who come in for two years to teach full time. They leave top jobs in companies. They leave university to actually come and do this. So building an awareness is a huge one. Um, mobilizing money and funding is a huge one. In our next five years, we want to reach one million children and give them the opportunities that, that Rituja has today. So it's a really daunting goal for us financially as well. And the third is people. So coming in uh, to volunteer, most welcome to come in, have your families come in, have employees from your company come in uh, once a week. We do work on Saturdays as well. People can come in for one-off things, um, to organize a workshop or to take kids on a field trip or to sponsor something special for the kids, or they can come in regularly. So awareness, money, people are all very, very, very welcome. Um, and if you just write to us, we can definitely connect and take it forward. Thank you Thank so you. much.